Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we welcome you to the next session of Motives organized by Growthentic School of Thoughts. It is my great pleasure to see you all here. Well, I think uh, we should beg your apology for so many rescheduling of the of this particular talk. But you see, uh, this happened because when you started the school, we kind of assumed that uh, people have good idea about abelian categories so that we can start off no motives right away. But the survey that we had conducted revealed uh, a negative truth. So we had to arrange the speaker on abelian categories and we did so, but uh, the speaker had some personal problem and he got to know just before we had to cancel and then we had to arrange the new speaker. So that's, in any case, we are really sorry for this. We hope that this won't happen next time. From next time onwards, we'll try to keep this on Saturdays 11 a.m. And uh, yeah. So for this particular talk, we have Professor Saran from IIT Madras. He works in algebra geometry and K theory. He'll be talking about abelian categories and derived functors today, which is uh, kind of the initial step to learn chief cohomology and therefore to learn no motives. So without any further delay, I'll uh, invite Dr. Saran to take over this. Uh, Professor yeah. Saran, to you. Yeah, thank you, Dipankar. Uh, yeah, so I, before beginning, maybe I'll, I'll, uh, uh, I'll say that I, I, I kind of, uh, I'm usually much more prepared for this than, than, than I am today. Uh, I kind of had to prepare last minute and uh, really, this is not my topic. I'm not an algebraic geometer in that sense. Uh, I, I I work more in commutative algebra, and it's been a long, long time since I really dealt with uh, this kind of um, uh, category theory. In the sense that, uh, uh, from Dipankar's mail, it it uh, uh, and whatever the topic of the school uh, or this this particular uh, topic, uh, Nori motives, etc. It uh, uh, what I understand is, uh, you want to eventually study chief cohomology. I mean, I think that's coming in the next uh, talk or talks. And uh, uh, so the background for that is abelian categories in the sense of um, uh, there is a famous paper of Groth and Dick uh, called the Tohoku paper, and uh, where he lays down a bunch of um, uh, extra axioms. So uh since i am more of a commutative algebraist i really have no direct need for those axioms as such i mean, I, I work with things for noetherian theory and so on so uh so that that's a caveat so there's a sort of gap between when i have studied this thing or read this thing and and now but i just agreed because uh, this seemed like a very good initiative and i i felt it uh it would be a good idea to contribute and sort of keep for the sake of continuity so, uh, as I mentioned to Dipankar in my mail, uh, uh, what I I might end up doing is recalling for many of you what you already know. I I don't know if uh, many of you may have already studied uh, sort of the basic community algebra, where um, maybe not in the context of abelian categories, but nevertheless, all the results are going to be maybe familiar. Um, so I'm I'm going to sort of do abelian categories from that perspective. Time permitting, I'll tell you what the extra axioms are and why they why they uh, are required. But it's the next speaker who is re who really uh, will hopefully put them to use and and uh, probably have much more expertise than me at at this. Okay. So with that caveat, let me share my screen. Uh, okay. Yeah, so this is, I, I hope all of you can see this. Okay, so, so for much of what is going to happen, uh, because it's fairly abstract, it's a good idea to keep some examples in mind. And the canonical example always for an abelian category is the category of modules over a ring. So, uh, uh, if you feel more comfortable commutative rings, I think that, that that's a better, um, I mean, that's even easier to sort of 
keep as a model in mind. Uh, there's something on chat. Can you please turn on your video? Uh, sure. That, that's to me. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Only thing is my video is not set up in a. Okay. I, I rarely. Uh, yeah. One second. Okay. Yeah. I, I hope uh, I'm visible now. Anyhow, uh, yeah, I can see some familiar names. So hello to those whom I know. Okay. Uh, by the way, I, I, since I'm sharing the screen, I, I, I may not be able to catch the chat immediately. So feel free to just stop me at any point. And I'm also very likely to make mistakes since I've not prepared. Uh, this is very last minute. So feel free to stop me and uh, point out any mistakes that I've made. Okay. So I assume that everyone knows what a category is uh, just to um, uh, sort of recall. So a category essentially, so of course there are set theoretic issues and so on, but without bothering about such things, a category comes with a set of uh, objects. So a category comes with a, a collection of objects and it comes with a, a collection of morphisms. So this collection of morphisms is the disjoint union of uh, the morphisms between A and B, uh, where A and B are run over the objects. So as I said, the example, prototypical example of an abelian category to keep in mind, is uh, modar. Okay, so with that, let's go to the definitions. So uh, we want to get to abelian category. So before that, there is some uh, sequence of uh, steps to follow. So first of all, there is something called a pre-additive category. So as you can see in the definition here, a pre-additive category is a category such that this morphism set uh, has the structure of an abelian group. And it's typical in that case to denote it by HOM rather than MOR. So, so here I will be calling it HOM uh, uh, for the rest of the talk. And uh, this is in keeping with the idea that these are homomorphisms. So HOM is, has, uh, is an abelian group and composition of morphisms is bilinear. So what that means is uh, if you take HOM a B cross HOM B C to HOM A C. So this gives you a map. So you have F comma G. So what is this map? This is the composition map. So this is G composed F. And what it's saying is it's bilinear. So that means if you take F1 plus F2, then G composed F1 plus F2 is uh, G composed F1 plus G composed F2. And that plus is the uh, plus in this abelian group structure that you have on HOM maybe. Yeah. And similarly, if you have G1 plus G2. Okay. So that's what uh, is meant here by bilinear. Of course, we know this for, uh, for, for example, for the category of modules. Okay. So then uh, beyond the pre-additive category, uh, we want more structure on our, on our category. So there, uh, uh, we further assume that it has something called a zero object. So by the way, I, I should ask, is this all uh, very, uh, maybe I should ask Deepankar, is this familiar or I mean, uh, am I going too slow or is this thing like, is this the spirit in which you had asked me to give the talk? No, no, you can carry on as you wish. Please. Okay. So this is fine, right? Or is this yeah, yeah, too, yeah, yeah, is yeah. not too trivial? No, 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 no. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. So then, uh, uh, in a pre-additive category, if it has something called a zero object, uh, which I'll define in a minute, and it has finite products, then it's called an additive category. So let me tell you what is a zero object. So a zero object is uh, an object which is both initial and final. So zero object is equal to initial object and final object. Okay, so what are these things? So let's recall that. 
or maybe not required let's define that so what is an initial object so an initial object means so if a is an initial object so a is an initial object that means it has a unique morphism uh, to any other object so hom ab is some there is a unique homomorphism from a to b yeah so if uh, there is any other object li like b then there is only one such arrow yeah uh, so that's the definition and of course this forces that uh, hom a comma a is just the identity a so this implies that hom a a is the identity of a okay similarly the final object is what you would get as the co of this uh, this thing so let's say if b is a final object then it has a unique a morphism there is a unique morphism from any object to d so hom b comma d there is some uh, unique morphism so uh, let me call it hash b right so there is a unique arrow like this okay from every object and what is a zero object a zero object is something which is both initial and final so that means it has exactly one homomorphism from uh, uh from it it to any other object and one morphism from any object to uh, that object yeah so this is exactly the role of zero in for example in the category of modules uh so this is mimicking the zero module the role of the zero module in in this category okay so that's a zero object and then it has finite products i think everyone knows what finite products are uh so maybe i i won't get into a definition of that uh but one thing to note here is that uh it turns out that if you have finite products then the finite product also plays the role of a finite coproduct so finite product in a pre abelian category is actually also a finite coproduct so sometimes one calls this a sum right coproduct sometimes one calls a sum direct sum or so if you feel coproduct is confusing uh, just think of it as a direct sum and in the category of modules for example you know that direct sums make sense you know that uh, products make sense and they uh, if there are finitely many then they match something we are aware of so this is true for any uh, pre additive category and in an additive category finite products exist hence so do finite coproducts and and they match okay so finally we can get to the uh, get to the definition of an abelian category uh so an abelian category is an additive category and in this category you can do the usual kind of uh, algebra that we are used to namely that kernels and co-kernels exist uh so just to uh, again remind everyone so if you have a map uh, a to b then the kernel for such a map so if you have f which is a which is in hom ab so we say that uh, k comma little k let's say this is a so this tuple is a, a kernel if uh, f composed k is zero and is universal with this property which means that if there is any other c so that uh, um, f composed g is zero then there is a unique morphism like this yeah maybe i'll call it k prime so f compose g zero implies that there exists unique k prime so oh oh uh, have i sorry i i i have drawn this in the wrong direction yeah and i'll also apologize because it's been a while since i gave an online talk using this uh so i am going to be a little slow so maybe i should call it g prime and not k prime yeah so it factors through this kernel that that's what it's saying so 
So this implies um, G is equal to uh, K compose G prime. Right. This is what what is a kernel. Uh, so similarly, you take the co of this thing, meaning you flip all the arrows, and then whatever you get is is called a co kernel. Of course, we don't know that such things exist. Right. So for example, one could take uh, say the category of um, uh, uh, free free abelian groups. Right. So if you take free abelian groups, then uh, kernels and co-kernels need not in general exist. Yeah. Um, so, so this is demanding that, that they actually do exist. Yeah. So an abelian category is demanding that they exist. And then there is a second axiom, which says monics are kernels, uh, and epics are co-kernels. So what this means is, so one way, this is always true. So kernels are always monic. So by that, what I mean is that this, this map K little K is always a monic map. So I, 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 uh, uh, so monic is like injective, right? Uh, you can think of monic like injective, uh, although here I should maybe define it, but, uh, let me not, since we are time is also, uh, we are also short of time. So it's like injective. So kernels are always injective that, that, uh, if you look at the universal property, you can prove this. But the other way may not be true, right? So it may not be true that if you have a monic uh, map, it's kernel to something. So what this is demanding is that if you have something which is monic, so suppose A to B is mon, uh, maybe not A to B, but let's say C to D is, uh, E to F is monic. So the new demand is, that E to F is monic implies that it is a kernel to something. That means that there is some F to G, uh, which I'll call little f and, uh, such that, uh, kernel of little f is this pair E comma little a. Yeah. I can actually drop the capital E since the little e determines the capital E, but anyway, I'll continue with keeping that since, um, uh, often we are more comfortable with objects. Okay. So similarly, uh, co-kernels are always epic. So, which means the map from, um, uh, map to the co-kernel is always, uh, subjective that that's something we are aware of. Well, okay. So I, I, I should be careful here, especially, uh, so in this context, they, they, they actually will match, but of course for general categories, surjective and uh, epic are not the same. And, uh, similarly monic and, um, injective are not the same, but here it's fine here, here that, that does actually make sense. Okay. So as I was saying, uh, so, so one way is to always true co-kernels are epic. So the demand is that, uh, every epic morphism also is a co-kernel. So that's the extra demand. Okay. So similarly, uh, co-kernels, sorry. Uh, epics are co-kernels. This is the demand. Fine. So, uh, so far so good. Okay. So now let's, let's take this third one. So the natural map from the co-image to the image is an isomorphism. So what does this image and what is this co-image? So, uh, what you can do is, so suppose you have a to B, you can take its, let's call it little f. You can take its co-kernel and remember that all these are uh, uniquely unique. So I can talk about the co-kernel. Then you have its kernel, then I can, so let's give this the name. Suppose I call this I and I call this, uh, Q. Then I can look at this map kernel F to a, and I can take its co-kernel. 
right? And that is called the co-image of f. Similarly, I can take the kernel of q, and that is called the image of uh, uh, f. So this is kernel of q, and this is co-kernel of i. Okay, and by general nonsense, you can prove that, meaning using the universal properties, you can prove that uh, there is a map from from the co-image to the image. So this this f really factors in this way that a goes to co-image goes to image of f goes to b, and that is f. And um, what we are demanding here in this axiom. Is that this map, this induced map, is uh, an isomorphism? Okay, there's something on chat. The third axiom in the, yeah, it is quite possible that this third axiom is is redundant. Yes, so I I may introduce redundant uh, axioms, uh, but uh, yeah, I I, I I I prefer doing that just to have clarity on I mean what is true and what is not. Yeah, you're right. So there is a remark that. Uh, the third axiom is redundant. That's true. I, the first two are enough to define it, but uh, yeah, I would still like to keep this. Yeah. So this is an isomorphism. Yeah. And as uh, Shubhajit is pointing out, uh, the first two actually imply the third. But uh, I wanted to introduce co-image and image. That's why I wrote this. Okay. So basically, the point here is, uh, once you are in an abelian category. You can really do things the same way you do as in modules. Yeah, this is this is uh, really the point, and is in fact a theorem that allows you uh, that sort of um, make this makes this even more concrete. It's called the fried Mitchell embedding theorem, and it says that uh, if you have If you have an abelian category and uh, well, let's say at least a small abelian category, which means there is some set theoretic issues behind the scenes. But if you have some abelian category uh, and let's say the the collection of objects is a set or very similar to a set, then you can really embed it inside. Uh, so, so if A is such a category, you can. View it as I, I'm being very loose here, but you can embed it inside uh, some category of modules. So, so this is the Fried Mitchell embedding theorem. So, there, there, as I said, there is some hypothesis on A uh, apart from me abelian. Uh, there is some set theoretical restriction, but that's maybe not the uh, uh, aim of this talk, or we don't have time also to get into those things. Okay, fine. So now we know what is an abelian category. Uh, so before going ahead, I just want to sort of uh, put put up these extra definitions. So as I said, I understand that this series is uh, the aim is uh, to go towards motives and so on. And uh, in particular, the next few, uh, the next talk or next few talks will be on sheaf cohomology, and uh, so to do that you have to deal with the category of uh, sheaves or possibly uh, i think quasi coherent sheaves and in that context uh, it is worthwhile to note these extra uh, axioms so these are true for um uh, for example for the category of modules but uh, but one just wants to sort of uh, emphasize them and the point is that if if uh, so if your category has these if you have an abelian category and it has these axioms extra uh, then so such a category is called a growth indic abelian category uh, so okay uh, let me be slower so let's first read these axioms so these axioms say so axiom AB3 says, uh, so C, okay, what is C? So C is an abelian category. So 
so so the axiom ab3 says that it has all possible direct sums note that when we did abelian categories uh so we said yeah it was an additive category so it had finite products and as i said finite products and finite coproducts are the same when you come to additive categories so here uh, one is saying more one is saying that it has all possible uh, direct sums so that is coproducts okay all possible so not just finite but all possible so this is something beyond beyond what the earlier axiom was the axiom ab4 says that uh it has all possible coproducts and uh this is this operation of taking coproducts is exact so let me explain what that means yeah maybe i should move this down sorry excuse me uh let me just move this down right so uh what is the meaning of ab3 and direct sums are exact what it's saying is suppose you have short exact sequences uh like this over some indexing set i then this is also short exact Yeah, so I should say for all, right? This is what uh, it means by saying direct sums are exact. Okay, and uh, then finally we have AB five, which says that uh, all possible coproducts or direct sums exist, and not just uh, it demands not just exactness of uh, direct sums. Um, but it demands exactness of uh, what are called filtered co limits so yeah this is a little bit uh, okay so maybe we should say what this is uh, so so a co limit is like a direct limit so in in you may have studied already what is a direct limit uh, except that here instead of having a directed system uh, you take the a uh, limit over over uh, some kind of diagram yeah or some category some what is called a filtered category so a filtered category is uh, similar to a directed system i i am being vague here i am aware of that but uh, uh, since the aim is to go to chief cohomology uh i i am not it is not very clear that getting into details of category theory is of much use uh, is of a lot of relevance that's why i am keeping it as um uh, being a little vague okay and i am also as i said i i am not as prepared as i would have like to otherwise i would prepared a slide etc slides etc yeah so this is similar to a directed system and instead of taking the limit over this directed system you can take Uh, the limit over this filtered category and uh, uh, so that that's what a filtered co limit is and what it's saying is that filtered co limits are exact which means that if you have 0 to ai to bi to ci to 0 and this i is uh, that indexing set so now it's no longer an indexing set but it's actually uh belonging to this filtered category i so if you have this then if you take the um uh, this limit over i then this is also exact okay okay so that's what this fifth ab5 is saying okay so of course ab5 implies ab4 because uh, uh, you can write down sort of a vacuous diagram and get uh, direct sum uh, as the filtered co limit so this is the co product so the co product is 
is also a filtered coal bit. So AB5 clearly implies AB4. Uh, and of course, AB5 uh, already consists of AB3. That's part of the definition. Uh, and then there is a co for all these things. Uh, so AB3 star is where you replace co products by products, where you replace um, AB4 star is where you replace again co products by products. And uh, here you replace filtered co limits by co filtered limits. Okay. So uh, the same exact thing, except uh, thinking of a directed system, you think of an inverse uh, uh, direct limit, you think of, of an inverse limit. And instead of direct sum, you think of the direct product. Okay, so that's what these things are. Now there is a big difference in in unfortunately in this AB three four five and AB three star four star five star. There are some implications, but unlike this situation where finite products and finite co-products are the same, this is definitely not true if if they are not finite. Uh, and so these are in general different. So now let's come to the definition of a Grothendieck abelian category. So this is what what uh, I think will be used in the next uh, talk. So a growth, uh, which is where you will see sheaves, and that will be a growth and abelian category. So growth and abelian category is an abelian category in which AB five holds, and it has a generator. So I I should also say what is a generator. So first of all, let's again recall AB five means that co products or direct sums exist, and these filtered co limits are exact. Okay, so what is a generator finally? So a generator in this context, uh, since I, I am already assuming an abelian category in this context, so G is a generator. Sorry, G is. A generator. For this category, uh, what did I call it? C maybe. Uh, if. Uh, given an object x in C, uh, there exists some uh, direct sum of G's so that this, well, I can say subjects now since I am I, in an abelian category, this subjects onto x. So uh, this is the definition of, of a generator. Okay. So this is very similar to what happens for uh, uh, for modules, right? In 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 modules, if you take any uh, module, you can always find uh, a free module which subjectively maps onto that, and you can use this definition uh, in order to sort of build complexes, which is what we will do next. Okay in various ways. So one is to build complexes, this is other ways of doing it. Okay. Huh. So we'll come back to why growth and decabillion categories in, in at the end, hopefully at the end of this talk. Fine. So now I, I just want to go back to abelian categories and I want to uh, uh, talk about um, uh, derived functors or homological functors uh, in that context. So now, from now on, uh, let me call it A. So A is going to be an abelian category. So I'm not assuming these extra conditions of uh, AB5 and generator and so on. Okay, something in chat. What do you mean by direct sum G? So direct sum over some indexing set. So you take some indexing set and uh, you take direct sum over that. Is that, does that answer your question? It's like taking copies, right? If you have, if I is finite, then it's like you have R direct sum, R direct sum, R n times. But now we are allowing here uh, as many copies as you want. Uh, yeah. So, um, right. Uh, so the point here is that this exists. Maybe I, I should make that point. Yeah, because we have assumed it's a growth and abelian category. If you look at the, sorry, uh, who can I? Yeah, so I. So, 
so i there some i am not very tech savvy uh, anyway yeah so uh, as i was saying it has all possible direct sums so this makes sense this thing makes sense okay okay so now i am going to go back to my good old abelian category and maybe for the rest of the talk this is all going to be whatever i am going to do is well known because uh, presumably all of you have taken some basic course in commutative algebra and have seen uh, much of this but all i want to emphasize is that you can do all this in 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 an, in any abelian category uh, so the first so okay why what is the big deal about abelian categories like why why we why do we want to go to abelian categories so one good reason amongst many is that uh, the snake lemma holds so snake lemma is true so can i assume that everyone has seen a version of snake lemma at least for the category of modules is that reasonable or uh, uh, or do i need to let me write down quickly at least what what this means so if i have a right exact sequence uh, like this and if i have a left exact sequence like this yeah okay i i should also say that i assume that you know what are left, left i mean exact se sequences uh, dipankar you should bail me out uh, am i correct in assuming that yeah yeah you can it? certainly do that yeah, most of okay. them are from algebra background so. okay fine thank you yeah so as i was saying this is a right exact sequence and this is the left exact sequence then i think all of you have seen that at least for modules that uh, if you take the kernels uh, so let's give these names fgh and all this stuff can be done in an abelian category then you have something like this these are the natural maps and then there is co kernel right and one good reason uh, for demanding that a category is um, abelian is that the snake lemma holds in that category so right you have these and then uh, so i can so yeah so yeah i'm not very tech savvy but let me at least Uh, as tech savvy as I can. So there is a connecting homomorphism like this, and this this uh, thing is exact. Kernel F to kernel G to kernel H to co kernel F to co kernel G to co kernel H. This is exact. So uh, yeah, kernel F to co kernel H is exact. right so this is what the snake lemma says and of course if if uh, if you further have that both uh, that you have either that uh, a1 to a2 is monic then you get kernel f to kernel g is monic and similarly if you have b2 to b3 is epic then you get that uh, co kernel g to co kernel h is epic so that's a, that's extra and that just falls out of this okay so this is one good reason for having an abelian category so i am not going to prove the snake lemma uh, the proof is a, exactly on the same lines as you do it for modules uh, maybe with a little bit of uh, 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 being careful about uh, you know the fact that you can't do element by element arguments but really if you if you allow yourself some uh, sort of set theoretic um uh hypothesis then you can just use this fried mechel embedding theorem then a is embedding inside mod r and just you can just directly use the fact that you know it for the category of modules but even otherwise the proof is very similar okay so uh, okay yeah so that's so so let's uh, assume that we know what what the snake lemma is okay so the next thing we can do is we can uh talk about uh, chain complexes so i think again this is something which uh, you may have seen before so a chain complex is um 
so a chain complex in A is something of the form Cn plus 1 to Cn to Cn minus 1. This is not necessarily exact. Yeah, and I, I'll give these uh, names. So del n plus 1, del n, del n minus 1. And the uh, uh, hypothesis is that two consecutive dels give you 0. So uh, del uh, n composed with del the other way. Del n plus 1 composed with del n gives you 0 yeah, for all n. Right. So this is a chain complex. Uh, similarly, we have co-complexes, which is exactly the co of this. So that means the maps are in the reverse direction. So and so in this case, the subscript uh, becomes a superscript. So minus 2 del n minus 1 and I may be I yeah uh, I don't exactly remember what is the convention whether we write n for this or n plus 1 but let me go with this for now okay and again of course compositions uh, consecutive compositions are 0 so del uh, n minus 1 and then del n is 0 for all n okay so then, uh, so let me call this C dot, let me call this C upper dot. So then um, there is something called homology. So the homology HI of C dot. So if you have a chain complex, you can talk about homology. So this is kernel of uh, del i mod image of del i plus 1. So since del i plus 1, so since the composition is 0, you can check that image of del i plus 1 is contained in kernel of del i or to make it, uh, I mean to say it better, image of del, del, I, del i plus 1 uh, actually is a, uh, has a Munich there is a the natural map to kernel del i is monic and you can take its co kernel and that co kernel is exactly hi of c similarly for uh, a co complex you can think about talk about co homology so that is where you take a kernel of uh, which one so del uh, i again and mod image of del i minus 1. So again, feel free to correct me if my indexing is wrong. Uh, but Okay, so again, maybe this is a definition many of you have seen uh, in at least in the context of modules. Okay, so now uh, it's time to have maybe okay 15 minutes. So what we want to do now is if you are given a functor, uh, ah, what is a functor? So first, a functor is something like this and I, I want to restrict my attention only to uh, uh, exact category, uh, sorry, abelian category. So A to B, both of these assume uh, it's an abelian, these are abelian categories and this F is an exact functor. So by that, it preserves all the uh, properties that that you expected to preserve. So direct sums, for example, are preserved. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, uh, zero object goes to zero object, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. So <clears throat> so suppose you have an exact functor here. So then, if you have an exact sequence in A. Sorry, short exact sequence in A. Yeah, I, I should have been very careful, right? Above also, I kept saying exact sequence. 
i mean i mean yeah uh, right exact short right short exact sequences right so here you have a short exact sequence in a so if you apply this functor uh so maybe if i give this names f and g in general what you can say is that you get maps like this yeah so again uh, dipankar should i say what a functor is or is is it enough no you can definitely assume what a functor is yeah okay i can assume what a functor is great yeah uh so all i can say here is that there are maps like this and uh f of g composed f of f so by the property of a functor this is f of g composed f and g composed f as we know since this is a short exact sequence uh so g composed f is zero so this is f of zero uh this is a zero in well whatever f of zero and uh, f of zero is zero as i said so we can get that um uh this is zero so this composition is zero and that's the best we can do for arbitrary short exact sequences so they need not give you uh exact sequences now for many good functors that we know uh in particular for the home functor so now uh so as an example in the home functor uh so okay let me do both so so i i'm restricting myself to the category of modules so um if you take the home functor so i have home m comma dash this is a functor from uh mod r ah okay so i i have uh without explicitly saying it i have uh assumed here that this is a covariant functor which means that the direction of the arrows is the same sometimes it could get reversed so um i guess uh in this case this is a covariant functor and the other sorry so i should have completed this this is mod r to mod r and then you have another thing where you have om dash comma n which is from again from mod r to mod r and uh so let me Uh, recall so this is i suppose uh left exact uh covariant of course and this is uh left exact but con but contravariant so let me just make precise what i mean by that uh, i mean that if you take A zero to n prime to n to n double prime to zero, then there is a, a left exact. The first one gives you something left exact like this. Again, this is probably something all of you have seen in the oops uh, in your algebra course. Just want to remind you. this is exact right so that's what we mean by left exact and the arrows are in the same direction and similarly if you have something like this then again it's uh oops exact on the left uh but beyond this we don't yeah we we don't know that what happens here and maybe in your first course in 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 that topol uh, sorry in that algebra course you may have seen that uh you can extend this and you get 
things called the ext groups yeah or ext modules okay so those are the derived functors so so essentially this business of derived functors is some uh, way of uh, generalizing this provided you have what are called enough projectives or enough injectives so so now assume uh a has enough projectives how much time do i have okay 9 minutes okay so what is a projective so what is a projective so a projective object means uh if you have uh an epic like this uh, and since it's in abelian category you may as well think of it as a surjection then you can pull this back right so there exists some uh something like this so 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 it lifts over surjections and as a result if you uh, consider hom p comma dash this is actually an exact uh functor oh i think i made a mistake in 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 the notation what i earlier called exact was not uh, i meant additive and not exact i i apologize sorry so this here i i should not have written exact this this is an additive functor i i apologize sorry so by an additive functor it's a functor and uh, it takes it induces a homomorphism of uh, the on the hom sets because remember a and b are abelian categories so the hom sets are um, uh, abelian groups so uh, the induced map on those abelian groups is uh, a homomorphism right and as a result it takes 0 to 0 etc yeah so that's what an additive functor is okay so uh, i didn't mean exact apologies yeah so this is an exact functor so what do i mean by an exact functor i mean that it takes exact short exact sequences to short exact sequences right and that follows from the definition so this is an equivalent way of defining it uh, so if you put uh, in place of uh, m here if i put p then you have p comma n prime to p comma n to p comma n double prime but because you can lift this is also surjective so you have you have uh, you can uh, take this to zero yeah so th so this is an exact functor and the co of this is called an injective ob object so so p is projective if either of these two equivalent conditions hold similarly i is injective if uh hom dash comma i is an exact functor which means it takes short exact sequences to short exact sequences we already know that um uh, uh i mean from from modules and if you believe the fried mitchell embedding theorem that for any abelian category uh if you do this process of taking hom i can always do this right in an abelian category this this process always makes sense and it will give me a map to abelian groups yeah so maybe i should make that point so for any abelian category if a is an abelian category i can always look at hom a comma dash and hom dash comma b and this both of these are so this is left exact uh, covariant and this is uh, right exact sorry left exact contravariant yeah so this makes sense ha huh. and these are going from where to where from uh to uh, abelian groups both of them right and both are going to abelian groups right so this makes sense for for any uh abelian category sorry is there a, is exact functor sends 
a long exact sequence to a long exact sequence. Uh, yeah, because you can always break down long exact sequences uh, into short exact sequences by using kernel and image and so on. And you can check that uh, uh, functors send kernels to kernels and and um, images to images, I guess. So if it's yeah, if it's an exact sequence, yes. In general, it will send. No, uh, yeah, right. So in general, of course, if it's not an exact functor, it will send complexes to complexes. But that's all. That's all you can say. Okay. Uh, I hope that answered the question. So I am saying every long exact sequence you can break into short exact sequence, and then you can piece it up together, and. Uh, and from there it will follow. Okay. Uh, huh. So now, if I want to extend this uh, sequence, uh, maybe uh, or maybe all of you have seen already what happens if you extend this, then you get what are called the x groups, right? So if you have zero to n prime to n to n double prime. Then you get the long exact sequence for x. So again, I'm going back to modules. So then you have zero to hom m comma n prime to hom m comma n to hom n double prime. And then you can follow this up and you can uh, write this as x1 m comma n prime x1. Yeah, and I in a minute I'll say how. And so on, right? x2, x3, etc. Right? And the same thing happens for the other one. Okay, so I, maybe I won't write this down. So similarly, yeah, and those are also x groups. And then maybe if uh, depending on how far you went in your algebra course, uh, you proved that these x groups and those x groups are the same. So how did we define this? So this was defined using projective resolutions or injective resolutions. So you can either take. So how do we define this? Uh, okay, I presume this is how you did it. These uh, by taking projective or injective uh, resolutions. So that is uh, you can consider okay for. X i m comma n, either a projective resolution of n or an injective resolution of m. I hope I have the right ones. Uh, and then, then you can do this. So, what is a projective resolution? Just to recall, it's a. Uh, bunch of it's a complex consisting of projectives uh, which is exact except at the zeroth stage meaning so this is a projective resolution of m of m if uh, hi of p dot is uh, zero uh, if I is not equal to zero, and uh, uh, which one was projective n if i is equal to zero, right? And similarly, um, so pi's are projectives. And similarly, injective resolutions are uh, uh, 
this is a co-complex. So you have I n I n minus one, etc. I zero. Ah, I have changed my indexing. I I apologize. I I think I upstairs I I did it in the subscript, but here I'm doing it in the superscript. But I I hope that's not a problem, right? So I I is an injective. These are injectives. So this is a resolution injective and injective resolution of uh, n if oh I I should have written sorry these two have got swapped so there should be m here and there should be n here no uh, there should be n here and there should be m here oh it's already past five okay so dipankar can i take a few more minutes yeah please uh, can take yeah. a couple of minutes yeah so sorry it's That's going okay. over time yeah uh, so then if uh, these are injectives and hi of i dot is zero if i is not equal to zero and it is uh, m if i is equal to zero okay so how do we get uh, get these x uh, these x so you apply your the relevant functor on on the resolution and then you get your x so x i m n uh, can be obtained as either of um h i of so for m we can take this i dot within so this is the complex so sorry what does this mean h i of home of this <clears throat> by which i mean uh, you take the complex form i i comma uh, maybe this flips around again uh, which way should it be uh, yeah it flips around again right so you get then and so on so this is a complex and then you take it homology so sorry i should have written this as h lower i Uh, either you do do this or you do uh, h lower i of hom m comma p dot so which is again the complex hom m comma p i to hom m comma p i minus one and so on right so this is a complex and uh, and then you take its homology, right? And you can compare these using what is called, I mean, there are plenty of ways. Uh, uh, there are gadgets called spectral sequences or uh, the more uh, classical ways to use uh, what is called the acyclic assembly lemma. So can use the acyclic assembly lemma To compare this so again maybe this is something you did in your algebra course uh, but if not that this is how you do it so this uses some some kind of double complex right you you have hom m comma n and then uh, here uh, you have hom yeah, which way is it uh, m comma p naught uh, so this way Hom m comma p one and so on, and on the other side you have no. After taking hom, it's like this. So hom uh, m comma sorry, my bad. Hom i zero comma n. Hom i one comma n. 
etc and then you fill up this picture uh, so hom i0 comma p0 and so on yeah so you, there there is some uh, double complex you get and then there is a lemma called the acyclic assembly lemma which you can use in order to obtain that these the homology of this bottom thing and the homology of this this vertical thing is the same uh, i i will uh, uh, not go into that it's a standard homological algebra type argument uh, but uh, something maybe you should read up okay so what is the moral of the story the moral of the story is that uh, i can play the same game for uh for any so we let's recall we started with an additive functor and then you had a short exact sequence okay so if i happen to know that i have a left exact covariant functor then i can use the same same technique uh in order to uh define derived functors or uh homological functors so i let me just quickly say that and i'll stop with that so if you have so i'm back to my where i was uh, when i started this so which is this is an uh, additive functor or not this additive it's a left exact uh covariant additive functor and assume f sorry assume a has enough projectives so then i can do the exact same thing namely for uh, if you have a, a short exact if you have an object a uh then you can take a projective resolution of a and you can do exactly the same thing that we did earlier so if you have um uh yeah so so if you now want to define um the derived functors of of f so these are called the right derived functors of f so r i f of a so these are called the right derived functors of a so you can do this using the same procedure namely you take this uh resol projective resolution you apply f to to this projective resolution so you get f of pn to f of pn minus 1 and remember that uh since these are additive functors they take um uh complexes to complexes so this this is also a complex and now so this is in b so this is a complex in b and now you can derive uh, define why yeah so you can define rif of a as uh the homology of this complex now there's a bunch of things to check of course that these are independent of the chosen resolutions and uh, uh there is a different definition of what is a right derived functor a more abstract definition so uh, those are things that one has to check but basically the checking is if you if you have done this 
if you have understood how to do it for uh, the module category the category of r modules it's on the same lines there is really no difference the main thing you have to check is uh, is that it takes given a short exact sequence it, it produces uh, long exact sequences so given a short exact sequence it produces long exact sequences so you have something like rnfa to rn f sorry a1 rnf a2 rnf a3 and then rn minus this is the connecting map okay and rn plus 1 f a3 right so the main thing you have to check is so you have an exact sequence like this long exact sequence like this and uh, so this is really at the heart of what you need to check uh, and also some some property about how these connecting morphisms work and all of that if you remember how we do this this is done through the snake lemma so how do we get these long exact sequences it is through the snake lemma so if you follow the proof of the snake lemma and you understand also uh, sort of the um, category with a generator sorry grothendieck abelian category extra proper uh, hypothesis ensure uh, that there are enough injectives and uh, i guess uh, this is what what you will see in the next talk uh, and then use that to define sheaf cohomology so where you will take the global sections functor yeah i think I, i this is a good place for me to stop yeah i apologize this is probably been one of the worst talks i have given but 